Let me have a word of prayer. God in heaven, uh, Lord, we worship you today, and we thank you so much for your love. Uh, we just ask that you would continue to just pour out that love into our hearts um, as we gather on this first Sabbath of this year, Lord. Give us your blessing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My message actually today and, and uh, for the next couple weeks, I think is quite simple, uh, which is, is not to say that it doesn't have important or profound implications, but um, I'm just trying to prepare you for uh, the reality that what I'm, what I'm wanting to convey to you is probably not going to be uh, significantly profound or something you haven't thought of before, but I just think it's very appropriate for uh, beginning uh, the year uh, to think about uh, the thoughts that I'll be sharing with you. Um, when you see the title, Yours, Mine, and Ours, you might be thinking of the, uh, the movies that have come out by that title or of the stories about how families of diverse uh, situations come together and, and they're able to make it work and learn. And, and th those sentiments are not totally devoid of, of my thoughts today and what I'm going to share with you, but it's not specifically tied to the, you know what I'm talking about, the movies. Was it in the 1950s there was a 60s, yours, mine, and ours? And then they did a redo, a redo with Dennis Quaid. And um, Anyways, uh, some people identify with that. I'm going to be looking at it from a slightly different uh, perspective, though, over the next couple of weeks. Did anyone, we're seven days into 2023, right? Already a week is gone, you know, and they tell me the older you get, the quicker things go, and I just can't imagine how at light speed it must be going for, for, for some people, because it just go by so fast for me right now. Um, and it, it does go by fast, and sometimes it's good to slow down and, and to look at some basic things. Have you started anything new? Already several of our people have talked about how it's common to have uh, resolutions and things. Have any, has anyone started anything new? Or maybe you're not willing to admit it. Oh, if you, you know, um, maybe you started it and you've already stopped. And, you know, the idea of resolutions used to be, at least in my mind, a lot more significant within our culture. It was talked about more in, in uh in, in media and in the church and in schools and things like that. And aside from the uh, exercise equipment advertisers, <laughs> uh, I don't hear about it as much anymore. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I, I think it's a worthy thing to reflect on and think about an opportunity to start something new or maybe to make an improvement in your life. The vast majority of, of resolutions that are made are always about health right? And they're, they're almost always to either start exercising or maybe improve exercising or to change the diet to lose some weight um, or to stop smoking or, or the vast majority. And sometimes it's even more simple like, uh, I'm going to brush my teeth and floss a little bit better or, you know, it's all, it just generally is health related. Um, and, and that's fine. I mean, some people might have financial resolutions and, and things like that, but but um, a lot of times we use this as an opportunity to think about, you know, I want to I wanna have a happier and more successful life, and making these changes in my life is, is going to benefit me. And I think as believers, as, as people of faith, it's also healthy to think about our spiritual health. Uh, we, we might say, yes, it's good to, to trim the waistline. I've got some work to do there. I'm feeling some tightness and some clothes I didn't used to. We need to work on that. Um, and there's always, you know, there's always ways to uh, improve. Um, but the idea being that we shouldn't neglect our spiritual health. And that should, in many ways, uh, even be a higher priority um, in our lives. Um, from Review and Herald, every church, we're told, Every church should be a light in the world. Sad to think that the two things couldn't exist. You've got to have a church that isn't a light, but every church should be a light in the world. If there is in your church, now I'm not trying to suggest anything here. I'm not trying to say that's what defines this church, but just the sentiment. If there is in your church a deadness, a stagnation, come together. Now, as you well recognize, no relationship is perfect. No church has totally arrived. No, no situation is like, we have our, our marriage, we've got nothing to work on. We are just perfect today. We don't need to make a single change. You know that that's not really 
how it works. No matter what the relationship is or what the situation within a, uh, you know, the human relationship, there's always room for improvement. So while I'm not trying to say that this is defines our church being stagnant and, and dead, and I don't believe that to any degree, but there are things we can work on, amen? There are things that we could uh, improve. There are areas, there are elements of our church that are not as vibrant as they could be, right? And, and that's just a reality that as, as soon as you uh, fix one thing, I'll just share on, on the health-related things. I hated going to the dentist growing up. I hated it. And it wasn't because I had lots of cavities or, or, you know, that I was problematic with my teeth. It's that I could never, and I had a great dentist. His name was Dr. Hatfield. He was very wonderful. This is as a child. But it seemed like I could never quite get it right with Dr. Hatfield. Um, at first, he'd be like, you're not brushing enough. You know, I can see you got some problems. You need to brush more. Okay. And so I had six months urgh, brushing like crazy. I'm going to prove to Dr. Hatfield that I'm going to do this. And then I go to the Dr. Hatfield and say, oh, it looks good. You're not flossing though. Ugh. Okay. Floss, floss, floss. I'm brushing. I'm flossing. Now what do you got to say six months later? Oh, it looks really good things, but I am seeing a little bit. Are you using any mouthwash, David? Oh, no. Forget it. There's a tendency to sometimes, you know, not appreciate. We get to a level where we're like, it's good enough, and we just aren't ready or we just aren't excited to take it to the next level. And that can happen in the church too. So it's just a worthy thing to realize that there's always room for growth. If there is in your church a deadness, a stagnation, come together. And the whole idea too, we probably wouldn't have the deadness and stagnation if we were coming together, right? It's almost kind of like a, uh, an oxymoron to put it that way. Uh, but, but she says, come together. And the ellipsis there is, as they did on the day of Pentecost, and plead with God until you receive the light of life. And then let the light shine. Again, if you're a church, but you're not letting your light shine, you're not really a church. You're a club, you're an association, you're something. But if your light isn't shining, all right, you're not really a church, right? If, if we're not somehow emitting the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we're not somehow alerting and lighting our community, our, our, our spheres of influence, uh, we need to come together and plead with God until we receive that so that we can share it. So uh, that's, that's the ideal. That's where we want to get. Uh, even if we're doing well in some areas, we want to uh, 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 come together to improve in as many areas as possible. Now, I anticipated that the kids would be mostly uh, at uh, Kids Church today. I did not anticipate that so many of our teens would be gone too because of the... Uh, um, the, the service trip that they're on, but I do have a little bit of an interactive time with any young people that want to participate. Can we go whatever color this is, gray and yellow? And so I don't have my young men that also help with the mics. Could I just kind of ask if anyone would help me with mics? I see Ben and Pastor John. So I know there's not a lot of young people here, uh, so I don't mean to lean on you too much, but I do want to see if you'll help me out with this little interactive time at the beginning of the service here. So uh, I, if you want to help, and parents, you can jump in or help, and we might have to have a go a little bit beyond. We want to get it on the mic so people can hear, and it's also on our YouTube streaming. What is the Laodicean church known for? There's kind of a quality that they're kind of known for. Do you know what that is? Okay, Mr. Tomas, young at heart, teen in his mind, yes. They were the church that was lukewarm. Correct? Warm. Uh, yeah. I'm going to go with that one. Say it with confidence. Gonna, Don't, you said they were the church that was this lukewarm. Isn't Jeopardy, where you have to answer. Uh, that, that was the form was of a question. Was okay. Yes, Mr. Tomas. They were lukewarm. And uh, that's, that's the quality that they're given to them. You know, we, we talk about if you've been in the church a lot, it's a, a well known idea. Because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of your mouth. Laodicea sat between two cities, Hierapolis and Colossus. Hierapolis had hot springs. They still do. Modern city of Pamukkala is there. Hot springs would flow down, but there were cold springs in Colossus. And the two waters would come together and intermingle there at Laodicea. They were known for having not very uh, appeasing and uh, lukewarm water. So that imagery is borrowed in that letter to the church to Laodicea in the book of Revelation. What do we lose? Now, I just want to hear some thoughts on this, and then I'll put some. What do we lose when we become Christians? What do we give up? I know I'm walking on dangerous turf here. This isn't like a specific A, B, or C, or anything like that. 
Do we give up anything? What, what do we lose? Carlos, are you wanting to share? <laughs> I know not a lot of young people here, so I'm okay to have others. Carlos, let's, Carlos, I heard you say something. My wife was talking yeah, um, yesterday. We're driving from the house from the doctor, and, and she was telling me about her brother-in-law and how he grew up in a house that he didn't have a mother, and he grew up with, uh, with an aunt that raised him, mm -hmm. and, uh, and how he became Adventist after he grew up. Mm -hmm. And after he grew up, he, before he grew up, he had the whole family that, that took care of him, and, and they uh, uh, party together, and drank together, and danced together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when he became a seven-day Adventist, he had nobody again, yep. as far as friends so and change. family, uh, extended family. Thank you. Yes, right over here. Madness. Madness? Wow. That's pretty profound. Good. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Maybe one more? Oh, up here at the front. I think we're supposed to give up our old self okay. and our way of life when we choose Jesus. All right, I'll throw a few up here uh, and just follow on. We do give up our wrong way of thinking, right? We give up our sinful beliefs, the idea that I can do it on my own, that I don't need boundaries, that I don't need God, uh, that being selfish will be just fine. We give, up, uh, we give up beliefs. We lose those beliefs, and those are good. We do become servants of God. We agree to become His bond servants, and so we acknowledge that we no longer have sole ownership of, of that which we are, our belongings, even our very bodies. The Bible says you are not your own. You have been paid, uh, you've been bought with the price, therefore glorify God with your bodies. Even our, our very bodies become the property of God. So in a way, we give up everything. We give up everything. Now the question is, but what do we gain? So now that's the next question. First and foremost to the young people. All right, appreciate your boldness. Thank you so much. Do you want to think about Wiseness. What's that? Wiseness. Wiseness. Well, that's good. You went from madness. Obviously, we give that up, that wrong way of thinking. Now we get wisdom. That's right. I, I think that's wonderful. Right over here. Thank you, A.B. Yes. Um, the love of God. All right. Yeah, we get that. Of course, he loves us, as the prodigal son uh, song reminds us. He loves us, uh, whether we accept him or not, but we certainly can appreciate it more. Carlos, keep it short, brother. It's coming back to my uh, brother-in-law, let's call it. <laughs> And he became a very strong Seventh-day Adventist. Yes, sir. Elder of the church and a very happy family and a mature man. Wonderful. Wonderful. Evan. Evan. Heaven. All right. Very yeah. good. We get new beliefs, don't we? We get new minds. We get new truths. We get freedom in understanding the hope that God has given us. We get new belongings, right? We no longer have, you know, the things, but we surrender all, right? We used to sing the hymn, I surrender all. But what do we get for surrendering all? We get heaven itself. Uh, is that a fair exchange? We would say it is. We even get new bodies, not only the promise of new spiritual bodies, redeemed bodies, new created bodies free from sickness and aches and pains and allergies and death and everything else that happens, but we also get a spiritual body called the church, the body of Christ. So in a way, we get everything. We give up everything, but the things that we give up in, in comparison to what we're given, there is no comparison we get everything. Okay, just one more question. One more question for our, our group today. What's the first B attitude? I want to specifically see if our young people will help me out with this. So I'm not going to lean on them too hard if, they, uh, if they're just struggling with it, but what is the first B attitude? Blessed are the... 
And theirs is the what? Any? Okay. Poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And what is, do you know the second part? For theirs is, yours is the? Kingdom of life. Okay. Oh, heaven. Sorry. What, say it again? Heaven. Kingdom of heaven. That is close enough. That's going to work. Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Ben, thank you. Pastor Jean, thank you. Thank you to our slightly different approach to the kids quiz and teen trivia today. You know, it's been pointed out, and it's interesting. Um, when you think about the Lord's opening words of the Sermon on the Mount, or in Luke's version, the Sermon on the Plain, it's widely regarded as really the first opening salvo of the ministry of Christ. Now, he had done other things before this. He had been baptized. He had performed some miracles according to the Gospel of Matthew. He'd had the miracle at Cana, uh, the turning of the water into wine before the Sermon on the Mount. So, it's not that he hadn't done things, but it's widely regarded that when Jesus opened up his mouth to teach uh, the Sermon on the Mount, that that was his first significant ministry announcing his messiahship, announcing his authority, announcing him as the Son of God. He now is proclaiming without hiding, without, uh, well, hiding is not the right word, but without keeping it, uh, uh, you know, reserved, that he is the messiah. He is the rabbi that has the authority to teach, okay? And it's just very interesting that the very first words of the Messiah, of the very first sermon that would be the most significant uh, moment in the ministry of Christ up until then are the words, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I'm borrowing Luke's version of this now, okay? Um, it's just very interesting. And again, when you think of the end, when you think of Laodicea, let's look at that for just a second. Um, oh, yeah, I found that picture. I thought it was so funny. Lukewarm, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> if you know that reference. <laughs> but notice, notice what the challenge. Now, Laodicea is the church in the last days. Okay? Laodicea is the historical prophetic vision of God as God gives to the Apostle John there on the Isle of Patmos, gives them these different messages to the church that had, yes, that had modern day meanings in John's day, but we also understand that they had meanings throughout the history of the church coming right down to 2023 in Scottsdale, Arizona to our church right here and right now. Uh, we are the Laodicean people. Like it or not, agree with it or have anything, God sends it to us as a message of, of, of repentance, a message of warning, and a message of inspiration that we can learn from and move on for. And we, there's many parts to it, but this part uh, that uh, is interesting to me. We are lukewarm, he says, because you say, I am what? Rich. You say, I am rich and have become wealthy. I have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. And so, it's been pointed out, it's not anything that, uh, you know, I discovered, that it's just a reality that it's interesting that at the end time, the church is going to, so at the end, the church is going to struggle, or the church is going to be failing at the very thing that Jesus started with at the beginning of His ministry. Jesus taught, the very first thing He teaches us on the Sermon on the Mount, the very first words out of His mouth, blessed are the poor. Now, Matthew adds in spirit, poor in spirit, okay? Luke just keeps it poor. Blessed are the poor because yours is the kingdom of God. And in Revelation, the Laodicean church has forgotten that. They've totally reversed it and said, I'm not poor. I got everything I need. I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I'm comfortable. I'm not even sure I need you, God. I don't need your kingdom because I'm so comfortable and wealthy. And you have this juxtaposition between these two elements. And so it's healthy and it's, I think it's wise to be reminded and to look at what Jesus is trying to teach us here at the very beginning, the very beginning of His ministry. Blessed are 
the poor. And there's so many different ways we can look at it. Here, just again from Luke, all the people were trying to touch him. Power was coming from him, healing them all. And turning his gaze towards his disciples, he began to say, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, there's so many different ways uh, you can uh, apply and analyze and interpret uh, all the different uh, meanings of what it means to be poor, but the, uh, the, the whole idea is, it, even if you are the wealthiest person on planet Earth, if you're Jeff Bezos, okay, if you're Mu- uh, Elon Musk, uh, if you're, uh, what's the Facebook guy, Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, right, uh, Bill Gates, right, in compared, now they got a lot of money, they got, they got a little bit more than I do, probably a little bit more than most of us here have. In comparison to the glories and the, and the blessings and the wealth and the privileges of heaven, how much do they have? And it's fleeting. It's fleeting. I hear that Elon Musk just lost like $20 billion to 200 it's had for, I left a zero off of that, you know, uh, you know, I guess he left his wallet at the restaurant. I don't know, but he lost $200 billion. It is fleeting, and they can't take it with them, can they? Even, the well, even if you're applying the idea of poor as material, physical wealth, and it can mean spiritual, emotional, other types of, of, of poorness, but even if you're looking at it from a material way, there is no value on earth in comparison to the kingdom of God. Amen? No value. So, blessed are the poor. We are all able to relate. Now, sometimes people say, well, uh, I, we do need to show tender mercies to the homeless. We do need to recognize and encourage those that are of, of very meager means that they too can have a place in the kingdom. That's not what this is about. There is a fundamental reality for every believer not to be uh, negative toward themselves, not to be, you know, self-martyrs, not to say, oh, woe is me, you know, I don't have enough resources, or, or even what I have is not going to be sufficient or anything like that. But there is a healthy reality in looking at the blessings and privileges and gift of God to us and realize that in comparison to what God is giving us, we are poor. And nothing that we have equals the value of what God wants to give us. Blessed are you, a poor. For notice this. This is one of the great paradoxes. You've heard me say it before. I love biblical paradoxes. They're all over. It is one of the main teaching styles that God uses in the Bible. If you want to live, you got to die. If you want to be rich, you got to be poor. If you want to be first, you got to be last. That's a paradox, right? If you're not uh, an English major, and I'm not either, okay? So. Um, here you have the, the very first words of Christ at the Sermon on the Mount, or here again in Luke, the Sermon on the Plain, <laughs> is a paradox. Blessed are the poor because you've got everything. And you say, that doesn't make sense. Why am I poor if I have the entire kingdom? But Jesus is inviting us to work with that tension, to realize the meaning here. Blessed are you when you realize just how valuable the gift God has given to you is. You know, Jesus tells several parables, and, and there, a couple of the parables illustrate this very well. He talks about the, uh, the, uh, the guy seeking the pearl of great worth, right, or the pearl of great price. You remember that one? And when he finds the pearl, what does he do? He sells everything that he has in order to acquire that pearl because it was worth more than anything he owned, right? That's the value. He talks about the person uh, out plowing the field who stumbles upon a treasure, a treasure of such great value. The same thing, he sells everything that he has in order to acquire that great treasure. That is the value of the kingdom. It's worth everything that we are, and it's an exchange that God is willing to make. Just to to lead on, I'm going to be talking about yours is the kingdom of God today. Next week, I'm going to talk about how our mind The gift of God is the righteousness of Christ, and then ours is the ministry of the gospel over the next couple weeks. What does it mean, yours is the kingdom of God? We can spend a lot of time, we could spend all year on this, just a couple of quick points of what the kingdom of God reality looks to the believer as the Bible teaches it. Oh my, did you get that? Telling you, super profound. Sometimes in the translation, these things happen as I send it from one machine to another. That's supposed to be from uh, Matthew 6, 33, and you all know that by heart. Let's quote it together. 
Matthew 6, 33. Amen. Let's begin it together. See, ah, some of you do know it. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. That's cool. I like that. That's, so the kingdom of God, whatever it is, whatever it is, the Bible says it should be the first and highest priority in your life. Everything else comes after, but if we've got this out of order, if we're like, well, yes, blessed are the poor, and there's, you know, you're, you're saying, but I got to get these other things in order first, and then I'll start looking at it. God says it doesn't work that way. I am offering and giving you this as a gift and as a promise here and now, and you can reach out and take it, and, and if you make it a priority in your life, um, you're going to be blessed by it. Number two, this is just uh, the, the one, I'm happy to go by memory now because I don't have this written down. This is just the reality of, 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 um, uh, of the beatitude, blessed are the poor. If you want to access the riches and promise and the hope of what it means to be part of the kingdom of God, you have to realize you need it. It's simple as that. You cannot have the Laodicean mindset. If you are simply of the mindset that I am rich, I am comfortable, I am happy, I am healthy, and I have nothing that I need from you, God, and you want to put yourself kind of in that position of being a, you're, I'm appreciative of God, and God, you're out there, and you've done great things, but, but you know, I don't need you that much. You're going to miss out on, on realizing that's what it is to be lukewarm. You're going to miss out on that. Number three. Luke 12, 32, or is it 33? <laughs> Luke 12, I think it's 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for the Father has chosen to gladly give you the kingdom. Do not be afraid, little flock. It's right after Luke's version of seek first the kingdom of heaven. Is it verse 32 or 33? 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for the Father has chosen to gladly give you. Here's the idea. The kingdom of God cannot be earned. It cannot be deserved. It cannot be merited. It can only be received. And that's the whole point. You're already, if you know that you need it, you know that you're too poor to buy it. That's the whole point of blessed are the poor. You're blessed because you don't deserve. You cannot earn it, but the Father has chosen to gladly, gladly, I love that word there. It's not hesitantly. It's not that the Father is biting his fingers and saying, oh, giving this to them is such a burden. No, he's like, please take it. I want you to be in harmony with me. I want us to live together in this kingdom. I want to give you this gift because I love you. And you cannot earn it. You cannot merit it. It is something only that you can receive. The kingdom of God is gladly given. It's gladly given. Number four, it's here and now. Luke 17. <laughs> I've forgotten the verse. <laughs> Luke 17, do not ask if it is here or there, for the kingdom of heaven is in your midst. Verse 10. Oh, no, it's not verse 10. It's verse 21. For they will say unto you, look, here it is, or there it is, but behold, the kingdom of heaven is here and it is now. It is not simply, well, one day it's going to be great to have uh, the security and hope of being in heaven. One day I'm going to have uh, uh, good things, but right now it's pretty rough, pretty ugly, pretty depressing. Last week I, I used the illustration of, of, uh, uh, of looking at the promises of the last days and living as though we had them now. I'm already there. Remember that? No, boy, I got to work on my sermons. Can't remember one from week to week. That's rough. No. <laughs> No, we're already there. We can live with those problems. Yes, we still have struggles. Yes, we still have aches and pains. Yes, there are still real issues that we have, but the kingdom of God is still here and now. It is not some futuristic thing that, that we can't experience the peace, the hope, the joy, the forgiveness, the relationship. We can have it now, not only with God the Father, but with each other. Yours Mine 
and ours. And the last one, kind of going right back to the beginning, God gives us the kingdom so we will share it. And we cannot appreciate it, we cannot really and you know embrace it if we don't receive it with an understanding that it is our joy and our privilege to expand it when jesus spoke to his disciples there on the sermon on the mountain and in luke's version and he says blessed are the poor for yours is the kingdom of god very shortly after that he commissioned his disciples to go out and preach the kingdom to everyone who would be willing to receive it and listen to it. The light is given to us. The church is given to us. The hope is given to us. Salvation is given to us, not solely for our individual benefit and joys and, and, and appreciation so that we can be a conduit and someone that can take that and share it with the rest of the world. The kingdom is given to be shared. And I use Acts 28 uh, and verse 33 for that one the last verse of Acts where Paul continues to share the kingdom of God. Let's see if we've got anything left here. The kingdom of God, this is from Romans 14, is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness, goodness not just unto ourselves, but to others, of peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. The kingdom of God is not just about eating or drinking, that's talking about in a ritualistic or earning our appeasement with God, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God. Others too will approve of you. This is the simple part, guys. Will anything be different in your spiritual life in 2023? Are you making any decisions to take a step towards God a little closer this year? I'm going to do devotions. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm really going to try to commune with the Lord in prayer. I've not been faithful in that. I'm, I'm going to make that step. I'm going to get in church a little bit more often. I'm going to support a ministry that maybe I haven't supported. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to I'm going to share my faith a little bit more at work. I've always been very shy about that. But when I see a coworker down, I'm going to just offer, you know, I'm a person of, can I pray with you? I'm a person of faith. What are you going to do in 2023 to show that you are progressing in your appreciation that yours is the kingdom of God and that you are seeking it first, that you realize that you are completely impoverished without God, that He has given it to you gladly, that it's here, that it's now, and that it's meant to be shared. Have you made any commitments? It's good to exercise. It's good to watch our, what we eat. It's good to figure out other physical health things. God, and that's a holy endeavor as well. God cares about our bodies. But I tell you what, if you fix your body without fixing your soul, you're missing out. What are you going to do in 2023 that's going to be different? How will you show that yours is the kingdom of God in 2023? Are you ready to take the next step with God? Have you thought about it? Will you pray about it? Let's pray about it right now. Heavenly Father, Every day is an opportunity to grow. Every moment, every week, every Sabbath that we come together, we can make new commitments and we can make new decisions. But there is something very important about a new year. It's just psychological. It, it, uh, it's just a day on the calendar. We get that. But Lord, if along the way we are making other commitments, commitments to relationships, to finances, to health, Father, I just pray among your believers that there would also be a significant part of our spirits that would also want to improve our walk with you. That we would not be that Laodicean mindset. That we would learn from that story and that warning and that we would work to distance ourselves from that. And that we would listen to your words at the beginning of your ministry. 
that without you, without your gift, without your salvation, we are nothing. But because of our appreciation for that, you've given us everything. Lord, help us. Help us to be that light. Help us to come together as your minister invited us to do. Help us to be a family and help 2023 to be a year of great faith. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, Lord bless you. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us. We hope that you come next week. Next week will be our first potluck of 2023, so we're looking forward to that. We will continue our, our Bible study also that happens after that. Maybe that's something you could do if you've not come to those before, uh, not come to potluck before. That might be something you would enjoy, so uh, I just uh, offer that out. But happy Sabbath. God bless you, and we'll see you again soon. Mm-hmm.